All right, good afternoon, everyone. Trust that you've all had an enlightening and engaging uh, couple of sessions in the workshops, as well as lunch. We'll get through this afternoon's uh, content and then we can all head back into somewhere warmer. <laughs> I can't believe how quickly winter has come upon us. And it's good to see, I think we've kept most of our numbers throughout the day, so that's good to see everybody uh, has stuck around. Just for those who are uh, tweeters amongst us, there's some good conversation happening on Twitter using the Digital Literacy 2015 hashtag. So it's good to see uh, the tweeters amongst us getting into uh, some good conversation and robust debate as well as documenting the, the highlights and the key points from the speakers that they're, uh, that they're listening to. So if you're, um, if you're that way inclined, I'd encourage you to keep on uh, tweeting for this afternoon. And it's a good way to sort of uh, look back at the end of the day and, uh, and get a bit of a recap of things that happened. So this afternoon we're going to move through our, our final uh, panel discussion. And uh, this is going to be uh, based around uh, partnerships and funding. So a lot of the, I guess, the, where the rubber meets the road for many of us when it comes to actually putting things into practice. So uh, this afternoon I'd like to welcome uh, Marion Morgan Binden and Ross Duncan who are going to be participating in the discussion this afternoon. As we did this morning, uh, each of them will present for a, a short time and then we'll have opportunity uh, to ask the panel some questions and then following that we'll open it up a little bit further into uh, you know, perhaps some broader discussion topics around things that you've taken away from today or questions that you may like to ask. Uh, the panel here on the, on the stage this afternoon or any of the speakers that still may be uh, in the audience uh, amongst us. But to begin with, uh, we're going to have Marion uh, come and speak to us. Marion is the Gold Coast City Librarian, which is the second largest public library service in Australia. She has a core vision of Australia's public libraries as shining examples of community cohesion and well-being, economic growth and cultural identity. She values opportunities for collaboration and partnerships to ensure library spaces remain incubators of ideas, innovation and forces for social change. She's held various roles in the private sector and in government, special academic, public and school libraries. Please welcome this afternoon, Marion Morgan Binden. Gosh, that makes me sound like 105 years old. Um, good uh, it's been a wonderful day today. Thank you to State Library for hosting this and for all um, of you who've come and stayed with us. I've got quite an exciting um, part of today, I think, and Ross will get all the tricky bits about the funding. I've been asked to speak about partnerships that build digital literacy and those who, who know me know that I couldn't resist the cultural economy contribution. And then, of course, we're going to go on a little bit of an armchair travelling exercise, so you're quite comfortable. And just highlighting some of the work of my colleagues on the IFLA Public Library section. So, short and sweet. Um, initially, just going to talk to you about some local programs that we do run down at the city, and I know that a number of you are running Coda Dojo. Um, there's nothing like digital literacy and jobs for the future and the literacy skills for the future, starting with those five-year-olds. We've been running this for a couple of years now, and we run it in partnership for um, with Coding by Numbers co-founder Craig Aspinall and his mentors. We haven't had any problem getting the mentors and they've been running this each week now for, for two years and we're incredibly grateful. Um, 13 to 17 year olds in the teens, we run the usual mashups and Photoshop workshops and this isn't to say that I'm sure there's a lot of other libraries who do these things and this is just a snapshot probably of, of the programs that you're running in a slideshow. 
The Teen Tech Week is another important part of, of what we do, you know, embracing and connecting young people with different formats and technology. Partnerships. Partnerships are just critically important to us. And this was something that one of the experts from the Gold Coast Film Festival gave us. We offered some space and some um, access to our equipment. And what they gave us was a six-week course in filmmaking for teenagers. They then took it up and... Um, mashed up, that was on their mobile device, so they took their content, they mashed it up in the um, media lab and in the sound lab and they had a week to create it and then had their own film festival in the auditorium. Pretty, pretty special and that was a partnership that didn't cost us anything but it was only in terms of um, access to some of our resources. The culture hack. Culture Hack is something that we're probably running for our creators. And the um, object of that is to strengthen the entrepreneurial and commercial capacity of our artists and um, the creative and cultural sectors. And it's about establishing new working relationships across the art sectors, technology, business and creative industries. The Media Lab, as a lot of you have said, it's all about collaborating, creating and inspiring and there's a range of programs there that we do in that space that you can do those things. Then bring the family in. If you want to work together with your family, bring them in on the Thursday night and, and work on those apps or those special things that you're doing. We run a, a series of workshops for people who are starting their own business, who'd like to get online, like to do something. And this was one we run for the craft, um, the people who have their own little cottage industries. This was a, a comment from, um, it, it's a lady who went to one at Southport a couple of months ago. She's now set up her own Etsy shop online. Um, she's an international artist, incredibly excited, and she never dreamed that she'd be able to do this. All through connecting those dots for people, making that difference, and just, um, providing opportunities. We did some partnership with some RADF, the Regional Arts Development Fund recipients, about um, their dream, which was about creating an augmented reality museum. We gave them some... Um, we gave them some access to our 3D lab so they could print their models. What that is, that star, that, that's a, an A4 sheet of paper, so fold that in half. The star is half of that, and embedded in that particular thing are there are eight different art forms. Video, photography, text, 3D graphics, animation, hyperlinks, slideshows. The possibilities are absolutely endless in what you can create, but it was just these um, aspirations of, you know, I guess where the future's going to and what it can actually look like. So they're embedding all that content into um, what could be a physical piece of art or, or whatever, and you just go and scan that and you'd have access to all that information. They were also, um, as part of their digital museum, they'd done a project called Sculpturing Our Waterways, whereas they were taking and mapping whole sections of the waterways printing it in 3D format and in colour, and then looking for other collaborations. Right down to that bottom chair, the legs of that chair reflect the patterns in the waterways, which you can see on the slide above it. So it was just that mixed modem, how do we bring all the different creatives together, what we can actually do to engage with our cultural folk. Now for the armchair travelling bit. And apologies to... My pronunciation is absolutely awful. Rijajka. <laughs> it's um, one of my colleagues in Croatia. They've developed an online magazine which were, was targeted at students and the young unemployed and they wanted to publish an online magazine that actually challenged their mainstream newspaper. They've got 68 regular contr uh, contributors, mostly under 30, who provide the content, short stories, film, essays, features, poetry reviews, and they're actually, within the first year, they're getting 2,000 visitors a day to their site. So it's created um, building a lot of digital capacity for all those people. Zagreb. 
in less than a year, the library trained 63 people to use ICT. It's flowed on the effects into employment, with um, um, 22 people getting jobs, excuse me. Um, they're encouraged a second homeless shelter to roll out an ICT program. Their partnerships are with a law clinic, various shelters, various volunteers and social, social welfare organisations that actually encourage the homeless to attend the classes. And the partner's motto is, let's carry on. And this is a story from um, a young man who'd actually been homeless um, and in the shelter for four years, getting a permanent job. The Fab Lab in Exeter, it's um, a real incubator space and it partners with the um, business and information hub next door. People come in, they refine their project or their object, they create um, a new prototype, they work together, um, all the while while facilitating access to new skills. Poland. Poland's also um, their multi-centre, it's called. It's multi-arts, multi-music, multi-science and multi-tech. It's open to people with all needs um, and any interests in any design, caricature, um, movies, animation. But what they also do is bring in a group of uh, children with disabilities. And since 2010, they've... they've um, worked with 750 disabled children who just absolutely love playing with the various models and various activities. Columbia. The library wanted to know what their users wanted and what their needs were and they went out to map their community. There was no map. So the library engaged with some open source experts and they trained 400 residents in bringing their memories, their stories, their everyday experiences to that mapping process. Um, the maps are online and they're actually now used to provide access to local business, creative, um, sorry, access roads, marketplaces, small business. And because it is online, it's updated constantly by the residents who've taken complete ownership of it and they um, are the most detailed of any of the other provinces over there. They also use balloon mapping. Does anyone know what? They haul out this balloon, um, a digital camera, and it's, it's, it's um, programmed to take photos attached to a string, and when they figure it's been out there long enough doing the lap, they reel it back in and get the content. So it's pretty much a hands-on um, approach. Um, and Nepal, Th this has been, um, th this is from 2010 to 2012 and I don't have anything following on from the earthquake. But the practical courses um, in numeracy, literary um, language, ICT, entrepreneurship, um, targeting women in particular who are able then to go out and, um, uh, you know, get their own little businesses, find jobs, earn a living, was that after an intensive 40-day entrepreneurial training, this group of women launched their own businesses. So it's pretty exciting stuff that the libraries are, are involved with. So I guess when we're thinking about partnerships, you know, let's, let's start at the beginning. And David Green from the Powerhouse just said last week, you know, for them, their partnerships are around um, thinking of, of what is it that's in their community and their practices. And for them, advocating and having those partnerships is actually a no-brainer. And I think that's something that our libraries do really well and it's something that we're, we're very, very good with. So, thank you. The um, library sector can't survive without partnerships and I think we're incredibly grateful to the large number of partners that I know my city um, utilises. We had 1,150 uh, 1 groups that actually delivered programs for us last year um, at no cost to us and it's actually incredibly moving. Um, the generosity of those presenters to continually give us that support and, and I guess that's something that public libraries and all your communities would be doing the same thing. 
So that's it for me at the moment. Just going to go. That's great. Thank you, Marion. I think there's some, uh, you know, one of the key takeaways there for me is about relevance to the needs in the, in the community and, and uh, uh, for myself, uh, actually being part of the Coda Dojo program uh, when it piloted uh, here in Brisbane and my daughter being the recipient of, of uh, some skills-based, uh, you know, on hands-on learning through the Coda Dojo program and also Startup Weekend, you know, those, are, those have some specific relevances to, um, uh, to the audiences that those uh, programs are being delivered into, but uh, finding that relevance to your local audience is something that I think through partnerships is, uh, is quite key. So thank you, Marion. We're going to hear from, uh, from Ross. Uh, I've forgotten the last name, Ross. Duncan. Duncan, there it is. It's on my ever-growing list of uh, notes. Uh, Ross is going to be talking about, the, 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 as was mentioned before, the, the um, exciting part of, of this afternoon, talking about funding and about opportunities for how we actually uh, get some of this, these programs off the ground. Uh, Ross joined the State Library as Executive Manager uh, of Regional Partnerships in July of last year and has since secured the role of Director of Regional Access and Public Libraries. In this role, his priorities include continuing the development of statewide grant programs, liaising with public libraries, supporting the development of skills of public library staff and focusing on strength strengthening advocacy for libraries. He's worked internationally in fields as diverse as, and he has this for a list, scientific research, private venture capital, hospitality, language training schools, music recording, aquaculture, childcare and quarries. Those last two go together in some strange, I know my kids love to work. Uh, <laughs> Ross has previously worked uh, for local government as well for eight years. So here to discuss uh, funding for our programs this afternoon, please welcome Ross Duncan. Thanks everyone for uh, sticking around this afternoon and for coming this morning. And thanks Dale for the belated idea about marrying childcare and quarries. If only I'd come up with that idea, maybe we still would have been in the childcare business with some outsourcing and sales of products going through the roof. I hadn't even come up with that one. So I'm here to talk about the interesting part of um, joining the dots, I guess, from Marion's fantastic presentation around the world about some great partnerships to one of my roles and challenges constantly is how, do, how does State Library help public libraries and their not-for-profit partners implement these types of programs? Does anyone know? I'll take them. <laughs> no. So it's a, it's, a, it's a consistent challenge. A little bit of context. So State Library provides around $22 million worth of funding and support to public library network across Queensland every, every year um, through provision of public library grant to local governments to purchase collections, to purchasing collections centrally from book club sets to storytelling kits to collections for the Rural Libraries Queensland Network to support of Indigenous knowledge centres alongside targeted grants programs. So $22 million, that's uh, a pretty significant amount. When you break it across 320 public libraries, Indigenous knowledge centres, uh, it becomes less significant. So I understand the challenges that are facing local government now uh, because I've lived them for eight and a half years when you constantly get cut back in positions in staff in, in, in establishment and then you get a deal amalgamation or an amalgamation loading put on top or an efficiency dividend placed on top. So back to Marion's point again, the relevance of libraries depends on your ability to make connections the ability to draw partnerships uh, and the ability to really participate in your community and support you, be supportive of your community in different ways than we perhaps have been in the past. So the challenge of funding, again, $22 million annually, in, annually into the network. One of my roles is to go out and try and secure additional funding, either co-contribution 
that aligns with some state government funding, that, that state library funding that we put through the network through grants opportunities or securing additional funding. So before I got into the role, State Library was successful in securing the best start, um, the money for the Best Start Family Lit Literacy Initiative. So that was the first time in a fair few years that new money had come into the public library network, equivalent to $5 million a year over a four year period. The whole reason that money was attracted was because libraries, public libraries were able to demonstrate evidence about the effectiveness of programs in the early years literacy arena. So, translate that into the digital literacy arena. Have we been successful in attracting significant funding to the network? No, not yet. One of the reasons that we aim to focus on digital literacy today is to try and align activities across the public library network and understand a little bit further about what sorts of evidence we could collate and collect from your activities in the network to then approach uh, funding organisations and other sections of state and Commonwealth governments for additional funding to attract into the network. So it's not trying to sideline some of the existing public library grant, it's trying to make that pool of funds bigger for councils to apply to through grants projects. So some of the activities that I'm carrying out now because there's no straightforward answer. I don't, if, if there was more money available right now, there would be someone more important than me dressed in a, probably in a suit and making an announcement. Unfortunately, you're stuck with me. So what I'm saying is that we're trying to advocate on your behalf and capture the evidence that you guys um, are being effective in, in what you're doing and trying to align it. So some of the things that we're trying to do is leveraging funding. So as we know that there's a, a state library grant round coming up, we're going back into state and Commonwealth government agencies and saying, here's what types of activities we're supporting through the public library, uh, through grants to public libraries across Queensland. Do you have any other co-funding that you could contribute at this stage? The answer to date's been no, but we'll keep trying about leveraging funding and attracting funding to rounds of grants as they go through. We're trying to align the grant round activities not only with the Vision 2017 document, but also with other strategic plans uh, of state and Commonwealth agencies, again, to demonstrate how libraries play a role in that aspect of the community. We're trying to identify strategic partnerships which public libraries operating a million miles an hour on the ground fully operational may not have the time to try and identify or identify partnerships at a state level uh, that public libraries can't access one-on-one. -on -one. We're looking at developing models on behalf of public libraries based on feedback or surveys um, or conversations we have with public libraries about where they want to head in directions in terms of programming. We're trying to help develop up models here to cut down, if you like, the research and development, the cycle time to get an idea that public librarians don't have the time uh, to research and develop to try and create an off-the-shelf package that they can just access free of charge. And again, that's not funding direct into the network, but it's trying to cut down the cycle times for you to bridge the gap between emerging technologies and, and public programming that you're carrying out. So in terms of digital literacy funding that has been attracted to the public library network, there's probably one prime example was the remote Indigenous public internet access money that was attracted. Uh, two years ago. So there's been two years of what, they, what is shortened to the Ripia funded program, which operates in 20 remote Indigenous sites across Queensland. So that's a nationwide program funded by the Commonwealth. Um, for two years, State Library's been running it, delivering digital literacy to remote Indigenous and, and internet connectivity and maintenance to remote Indigenous communities. And May 15th, the Commonwealth defunded the program. So have we been successful in even advocating for maintenance of existing funding in digital literacy? No. It doesn't mean we won't keep trying. So again, if we had better evidence about how the Ripia program would be scalable or a little bit more insight into how other sections of, or how other states and territories were capturing the results of their Ripia programs or the evidence of the effectiveness of it, we might have been more, suc more successful in making an argument to retain that funding. So 
is there any more funding coming? Well, if you see someone in a suit show up that's not John Gray, maybe. <laughs> but for this afternoon, I'm very keen to hear back from you in a minute as we have the panel discussion about what you think, how you think state libraries should be supporting you, what sort of role you see us playing in terms of digital literacy, attracting funding, building partnerships, a whole range of things that you've heard today. So that's all for me, unless anyone's got any specific questions at the moment. We might just invite uh, John and, and Marion to join Ross uh, up on stage and we'll have uh, a bit of a time now for, for questions. I'm sure that's probably prompted quite a few there and, and an invitation really uh, for you to, uh, to discuss, you know, what, what are some things that you think could be done uh, for your particular uh, areas and of, uh, of engagement in your communities. So we might just throw this open now to the floor, just in terms of questions around uh, partnerships and funding, and then uh, beyond that, we'll, we'll sort of broaden the scope of that into maybe some other discussions from the, uh, from the earlier parts of today. So do we have any questions for uh, John, Marion, or, or Ross? You guys just want to go home early. <laughs> So, well, I've got a question for Marion, if no one else has got one. So, Marion, you mentioned the Coded Dojo. What's, how did you attract them? What does it cost? And what's the next step? It costs us nothing. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, when we were building Helensvale Library and a couple of staff up there... Um, hello? Uh, we were building our digital media lab. So we're looking at establishing partnerships around the city and how we would actually deliver across eight particular art forms. And, and the other thing was jobs for the future. And it was coming forward that everything that you touch in life needs an app of some sort. What we were um, finding, and um, one of the presenters in The Edge spoke about today, is the shortage of skilled workers in Australia to actually... Um, do any coding, to do anything. So the coding by numbers was on the coast and together with two other um, companies down at Rubina and Varsity Lakes, we just approached them and Craig Aspinall came along very, very willingly with his team of mentors and, and runs the coding workshops for the from the five-year-olds up. They do a bit of robotics. They um, have a marvellous time, really. You go past and there's all these things hopping out of various things. It's very, very creative. So it didn't cost us anything. It's something that's really important to the Gold Coast economy, that we actually have jobs. In it. And someone spoke this morning about literacy. And for me, it's literacy in all its forms. It's not just reading and writing. It's how we actually build capacity in our um, cities for future work prospects. And one of those is, is just happens to be the coding. I might just add to that one as well, since, yeah, my, as I said, my daughter went through Coded Dojo here in Brisbane, and it's a great example, I think, of um, uh, like-minded uh, partnerships working the best. Now, in, in the Brisbane, um, uh, at least in the city uh, implementation of Coded Dojo, there was a, a, a strong representation from the, the tech startup uh, community uh, providing uh, the mentoring and the skills, and for those uh, for those developers, it was um, you know it was a, a form for them to be able to contribute back into um, their their community beyond uh, obviously their own personal work in building their tech businesses, but uh, for them it was a, an expansion of that and, and gave them some great purpose in terms of helping them in, uh, contribute to to community activity, and that's a great. Uh, pool of talent and knowledge, um, both from a technical perspective but also from a, an entrepreneurial type of uh, approach. We had a number of the um, people from the local gaming industry come in and talk to, to kids about uh, what it was like to build Fruit Ninja or, you know, a number of the other games that, were, that had come out of um, the Brisbane scene. So, great example of tapping into um, partnerships that, that, uh, that really... Um, create some great outcomes rather than it just being a, you know, a, can you come along and do this for us, but there being a, you know, a like-minded result and, and um, a, a great cooperation in that particular regard. It's great that you guys have all of that at your fingertips. 
but I'm from Cloncurry, and um, we don't have that. It costs me $800 return to come to Brisbane to attend this fantastic workshop. How do you tap in to a partnership that's going to come out there, you know, when all of our businesses are on the edge anyway? I can probably try and answer that question. Um, look, one of the things, and Marion touched on it, the key word I think has been partnership and collaboration. Um, probably over the past year since um, the government's launched the Go Digital Queensland strategy, we've had a lot of meetings and we're starting to get a very, I don't think we're quite there in terms of a good idea of what's out there, who's doing what. Um, the bit we're really starting to tap into, are the, particularly the not-for-profit sector who's doing a lot of the training using the volunteer groups and all that sort of stuff. So what it starts looking like is a bit of a, a checklist of saying, yep, we got that, we got that, we got that. What libraries is what we're finding out there, actually the ones who offer the venue. So one of the biggest cost prohibitors to people going out to training sessions is the cost of the venue, then you've got the cost of travel. What we're finding through Info Exchange and through what Telstra is doing, they're going out to these places anyhow. What we're not getting is probably the two-way feedback of, hey, these are the places you should be going because they don't often get people going out there doing that. So one of the things we're trying to do probably from my team is working with a lot of the state bodies, the peak bodies, the businesses, associations to actually saying, hey, we've all got little buckets of money, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 which we spend here and there. Why don't we join up together and rather do all these little events all over the place, which is not very good economies of scale, is how can we do a bit of a roadshow and get out to these um, you know, country and regional remote areas, but also look at options. We're talking about the digital economy and digital technologies. As, you know, we see webinars all the time, but again, I think the, and the gentleman up this morning raised the point is you know, they don't have the same sort of technologies and broad bandwidth and all that that the metropolitan regional areas have. So that's the other thing we've got to look at is how can we effectively deliver a service that you know, produces real outcomes. But again, I mean, we're happy to, and I think Ross has mentioned, to take on board, you know, comments, but the other thing is to share, hey, would you like to have this sort of stuff? Because the other thing we can start doing with the collaboration, the partnerships, is say, hey, we still need someone to cover this element before we can go out there. Um, but there's some really good stuff I can see happening over the next six to 12 months where we'll start to see particularly regional areas of Queensland get some of the stuff that they no normally don't get. Right. I might respond in a, in a slightly d different way to that. I'll give you two examples that, are, that are, uh, demonstrate very different approaches to it. One is, um, an app, so I don't know who saw uh, Yvette Adams mm. speak this morning from the Creative Collective Training Collective. So what I worked with her when I was based on Sunshine Coast to try and access small business development seminars because I, I didn't have anyone in the local community that I could afford to pay. So we struck up a bit of a uh, idea about, well, come along and see what libraries do. And then um, council secured $160,000 for, for Skilling Queenslanders for Work program. So we looked at it a different way. We didn't look at the library. We looked at what's council trying to achieve and what are the state government um, aims and aspirations in the area and is there funding attached. The reason I mentioned that one is that we secured $160,000 not for a Sunshine Coast opportunity but for the development of a statewide through, delivered through five libraries regionally about small business development, online um, upskilling for small business which has translated and they've done a lot more work on it since which is the Get Up to Speed program now. So that's one example. We looked at different funding it, different initiatives rather than just what we wanted to achieve in the library. We tried to connect libraries to higher level aspirations. A second example and a different example um, that maybe inform uh, you, your challenge and everyone's challenge I guess is that if you can't afford to buy it and you can't afford to rent it in then you need to loan it from someone. So if you can't afford to buy equipment or, or rent equipment, maybe you need to loan it. And if you can't afford to buy or, or rent the advice, you need to loan it or partner with it in, a, in some sort of free, free way. And that's not an easy one because it depends on who else is active in your community and how you sell what you do. So one of the activities that we are still 
but we still have bubbling away here at State Library is working with um, Apple to develop, or well, some people from Apple and the resellers developing up kits that could be loaned to public libraries with content for delivery of Internet of Things on a small scale through health and wellbeing accessories and apps for smartphones. So that's not answering your question, but it's looking at it from a different angle because I don't think there is an answer to your question and it's an ongoing challenge. But the things I have become aware of are the funds about Oz industry from the Commonwealth and skilling Queenslanders for work. There's $240 million in skilling Queenslanders for work. Now, a lot of instances there's no work out there at the moment, but they're not saying employability, they're not saying employ, they're saying skilling Queenslanders for work. So maybe there's something in that, but I'm, I'm happy to provide more information if I can, can on that one. Um, it's sort of a question and a comment. It's uh, Jackie Kinder from East Smart Libraries. Um, we've, we've partnered and, and uh, a lot of the library associations across Australia are supporting East Smart Libraries because of development of staff skills and professional development. Um, we come to you. Um, so we will train in clusters across the country. There's been some fantastic outcomes and I'm really happy to say Logan in, uh, in Brizzy and uh, Mount Isa are doing fantastic work. Um, so they have been to eSmart training in terms of development of staff skills and user guidance around cyber safety, fraud, scams, identity theft, bullying, cyber safety. They're doing outstanding work. Um, and I noticed there's a few of our wonderful partners here in the not-for-profits, um, HitNet and GoDigi. So um, if there's anyone who would like to speak to eSmart and, and all of the other not-for-profit um, people here in the room, um, I can pinpoint a few who are doing wonderful work um, across Queensland. Do we have any other questions? Yep, in the middle there. Um, I think this one. I think this one might be for Ross. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's an easy one. <laughs> um, but uh, okay. So, to what extent? Um, I've, I've sp I had. A, I, I was lucky enough to actually attend Yvette's um, session before, and I posed this question to her. Um, uh, and it's one that intrigues me, sort of professionally. Is to what extent uh, is marketing um, part of the? Uh, the solution here, like to, to what extent do we, because we talked about um, getting extra funding for resources and programming, but without uh, a substantial marketing initiative to go with those, and th they'll sit on the shelf and they won't get uh, used and thereby, we, you know, we won't turn up with the metrics to get them replaced by, you know, the funding bodies in the first place. So what, what do I know, is there uh, like a requisite targeting sort of, um, in, like initiative in, in, in going forward for a lot of these programs? Do you see it as, as being something that's very important? The question about marketing is a good one for public libraries in general, I think. One of my roles and one of the sections of my role actually that I spend a lot of time on is going back to state government, going across the river to other offices uh, and saying, here's what public libraries do. Not, you know, here's here's a book and here's what, what we used to do, here's what we do. This, there's this many members, there's this many visitations, they're in this number of communities. This is the, the engagement, the level of engagement they've got with different, um, different sections of their community. And I don't think, I'm a bit of a convert having managed public libraries for a while, I don't think there's another section of local government that has such a positive close relationship. So that, one of my roles is going and selling the message about the power of engaging the public through public libraries. Now that's only a small aspect of the marketing and promotion of libraries, but it's starting to yield different types of discussions about public libraries and their role. Is, is that more important than marketing to no. the public? Like that's no. sort of marketing to almost. No, I, well, th the reason I'm doing that and carrying out that function is because public libraries across Queensland can't do that. So it's not more important, it's just what I'm able to do with, with no budget associated with it. It's part of my role. In terms of going forward, uh, 
so part of the Best Start initiative will be a statewide awareness campaign of the, the requirements of early years literacy uh, and the role of, li well, not the role of libraries, but making people aware again about libraries. Bundaberg Regional Council has just recently released a TV advertisement. A few years ago, I made some cinema advertising. So there's, it's a bit of a haphazard approach. Has State Library got a plan that we've developed for a statewide awareness campaign? No, but we'd be keen to have a discussion with Queensland Public Library Association and other sections of state government about what it would look like, how we would fund it, definitely. Yeah, I think, and just touching on the marketing side, I think, you know, one of the things that's came out today, I mean, Tim said it, I said it, in terms of, you know, we fully didn't realise until we started getting involved in particularly the community aspect of our um, work, what actually state library and library, public libraries do. You know, we were stereotypically looking at it as a place you used to borrow books from. Um, so I think one of the key aspects is getting those non-traditional users and stakeholders who deal with libraries involved, you know, like the Chambers of Commerce and people like that. A lot of libraries hold small business weeks, but how often do they partner with the you know, local chambers? From what some of the anecdotal stuff I get, it's normally done on behalf of the library who've got a few, you know, small business owners who want to do something, or you'll get an approach by a few businesses who want to provide training, and so they utilise the library services and facilities to do that. One of the things we've established out of the strategy that we did was a business collaboration group. So that's got a lot of the peak bodies, we've got CPA on there, CCIQ, um, master builders from across the various um, industry sectors. And what we're finding is they're all holding these different events. Some of them are using libraries, some of us doing in isolation. And they've got the same problem is that they're holding these events, free events normally, and they're not getting the attendance at these events because either people don't know about it or there's too many of them around. Um, so one thing we can probably do is be better at, at, particularly at the strategic level, talking to each other and cross-promoting those events, but also joining up and collaborating on them. One, one of the other aspects of marketing that sometimes is overlooked is about libraries selling themselves back to their council or demonstrating, speaking about libraries in a different way to their council than they have before. I've done a few presentations in the last, uh, last three months probably five or six councils around Queensland about the role public libraries play in their community. And as you start discussing with councils, if you've got a waste management strategy or an environmental sustainability strategy, if some of your actions in there are about increasing levels of recycling, increasing the number of people who know how to re, um, have compost or keep chickens in their backyards, community yard, any of those sorts of community engagement activities, you, fine, you can run an activity day in the park. It won't be effective. The, re, the way to deliver on council's plans is to engage people proactively in a positive manner through their libraries. So as you start having those... Well, I've found as I've started having those discussions and presenting to councils from a state library's point of view about the value of their public libraries if they use them right, uh, we're getting pretty good results about council winding back their plans to reduce opening hours, reduce staffing levels, um, change staffing attention, uh, change staffing from being solely libraries to converting them to libraries and something else. So I think there's a number of levels of the marketing puzzle and we, I don't think we've we've done a cohesive plan for it across Queensland. The challenge is we State Library doesn't own own or operate the library, so we don't control uh, the marketing for them, but we could provide some support, guidance, uh, partnership arrangement for it, definitely. What, what would you see as most effective? Uh, well, I, I sort of see, especially like I could see that, that, that attitude of, of, the, of the branches being independent and should be, in terms of their own marketing, as being uh, relevant, like, you know, before everything became so digitally centralised, like because there is so much content that is replicated um, in such a consistent way through OPACs and through like e-resources and and whatever, that uh, that state library would have a singular opportunity because it you know they they'd have just more resources, and more reach to yeah provide mentoring or push out like you know the sort of things that your vet would you know was talking about are going to be hard for librarians of their own to pick up, but could be sort of pushed out from the top down um, by state library yeah. to 
Yeah, because I, I can understand exactly where you're going when you're talking about marketing back to government. That's, that makes a lot of sense because that's where the money comes from. But if we're going out to the, to the customers and increasing our customer base, then we can come back to government with, with more of that as well. Yeah. This one follows on from that one, so I might dive in. Um, Grant Young from the National Centre of Indigenous Ex Excellence. I'm not with a library, so this is, but this is a question for libraries, <laughs> I suppose, from my perspective. As a program. But you're a library member, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. That's fine. Um, uh, <laughs> as a program, we have uh, a non profit program, we have a fairly um, uh, comprehensive evaluation strategy in place. And, and Ross, in your talk, you mentioned the idea of collecting evidence. and. One of the things for us is that through that formal evaluation process, we're collecting evidence about the effectiveness of our program, different activities that we're doing, but we also have a principle uh, mentioned in our talk earlier um, about legible practice, which is sharing ideas, sharing knowledge. Um, GoDigi, I think, is a, is a great example of that as well. Um, given that you mentioned it, what sort of evidence are you looking for or do you think would be valuable um, in that effort to uh, demonstrate value? And secondly, what, can, what do libraries need to do different in your experience from talking to, to various stakeholders um, from what they're currently doing in order to achieve that objective? It, yeah, it's, it's a big question. The reason we, secure, we were successful in securing an additional $20 million was because we had evidence about the outcomes, not just about the numbers of people going through the doors and the number of loans that we traditionally measure in libraries. We had impact, demonstrable impact about in the early years literacy sector. So as we develop larger, or as we try and develop larger programs, statewide uh, initiatives and things like that, a key component of any, any discussions we have are about more rigorous evaluation to gather some more evidence. We've been gathering evidence at State Library since I think 1969. So every public library fills out quite a exhaustive and exhausting, because um, I've been there. <laughs> I've delegated that several times. Exhausting statistical return. Now do we go back and analyse that data? No. It, w it would greatly inform the trends and it would gra it w the trends would greatly inform the direction for public libraries, their programming activities. So we just start. We're just about to implement um, a project in data visualisation, a small snapshot of that data to work out can we easily take historical data and display it in a way that's easy for library managers to access and understand and inform their pr practice on that. So we need to do a lot at state library level to lead the way in evaluation frameworks. And we need to um, make it simpler for public libraries to evaluate their programs. A very good question. We're, we're working on a number of initiatives, but we don't have anything set in stone now. But without that evidence, uh, future funding is extremely hard to get. Can I just say, we use that data significantly. And each year at budget time, our executive looks for the comparisons so we can talk about in terms of literacy, our city reads more than any um, other LGA in Queensland. The turnover rate for our material is that, and, and Russell's not in the room, but I had to ring him and say, where's, where's the stats, Russell? We need them, we need them now. Um, so our politicians and um, executive do actually look for the comparison and where we actually sit and that return back to the city. And I think um, a lot of other library services, while they're not just sitting there, you need to pick and choose and take the data set you, you want. That was going to be how to, how to manipulate statistics, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> how you need to actually deliver the message to your um, elected reps. Thanks, Colin Crosby from State Library. Marion, uh, my question actually does build on that one and it's more about making program management decisions and the use of that data. So you highlighted some, a whole, I suppose, wunderkammer of activities that you guys do on the coast and um, there's an infinite range of choices available to you as to what you could do but you obviously have to make strategic choices about where you put your staff and your resource energies into. So I suppose I'm thinking back to Jenny Bopp's presentation this morning about the statistics. Do you make use of those types of things to know what community niches and activity niches we need to tap into to mm. get the best, most effective program mm. delivery? 
Absolutely. Um, our largest market share is 25 to 45 year olds. So we not only use the ABS stats or the government stats, but we actually use a whole range of other indicators um, and we also use our own library management system to actually give us where our market share is and what categories and where it is. Is that a delineator for programs? Um, yes and no, in terms of we build our programs around um, council's objectives and the culture strategy. So we'll work on digital city, um, learning communities, healthy, um, health and wellness, reading and literacy. So we build around the pillars and the programs fit under those pillars. Just like, uh, just like to ask about uh, future skills of a librarian. Where, what sort of skills would you see us needing for this sort of uh, approach? Um, I mean, at the University of Queensland, we uh, committed to more and more of our technical classes, etc., going online, and so we're taking away a lot of the face-to-face. -face. Yeah. But what strikes me as I listen to some of these ideas, this is a place where a lot of young people are going to go and learn, learn a lot, but they're going to fail. A lot of businesses are going to get started and they're going to need mentoring and sometimes they're going to fail. And so if we're going to be a centre uh, dealing with people going through some of these important things, do we need to um, almost skill up? Not to the point of counsellor, but, you know, will we need to incorporate these uh, skills into our core, uh, core set of skills? Do you want to say any? I can have a first go. Oh, no, <laughs> um, look, I think the question you asked is actually an excellent one in terms of it's not just librarians who are faced with that problem, it's any organisation who is being disrupted by what's going on. Um, but I think going back to libraries in particular is it's looking at who your customers are, who, who they come through the door. So if you're starting to get a lot of feedback from your um, people, members who walk through the doors and say, oh, it'd be nice if the library did this or if they did that, that's starting to steer you in the direction of saying, hey, if your customers are asking for this, because again, your traditional services like hard copy loans is diminishing. Um, so you either face reskilling your workforce or your workforce learning which thing, then you ask that excellent question, so what should we be focusing on? Um, that then really is a strategic discussion your library has with the council, if you work for, if you know, attached to a council, to say what do you see the role of libraries doing? Because the other thing that's happening is convergence, is depending which region you are, is libraries fill a secondary role or a gap, it may be around economic development, so you assist with small business seminars and things like that, or you go to the Coda Dojo path and help the young kids because you know schools don't teach that sort of stuff in primary school. Um, so again, it's recognising what the gap is. Again, the UK model, where you know libraries took a definite pass to look at business enterprise centres, so the librarians end up doing business advisory courses. Um, but you know, that, that's probably a strategic dis um, discussion that has to have be had with the library and the council together. Um, because again, particularly in regional remote areas, you've got very um, limited resources and you don't have this, you have skill shortages in both areas. Um, there's a chance for libraries to be, become more than just, a, I suppose, a place that lends out books and has meeting rooms for communities to give talks. And I think it's more around a core competency, just like you'd have an accountant or a doctor. They don't just sit back and say, you know, the world's a nice place, let's just wait till, you know, I participate or choose not to. Professional development must be a core component of um, your position descriptions and as part of the capability framework or as part of your training plan, staff need to be given access to the skills that they need. It, it's like self-serve, you know, technology's delivered as a solution to free up staff time to put those staff into frontline customer service, whether that be programs. You know, gadget bars, you know, we would expect all staff to be able to show customers how to download an e-book you know, show them a variety of tablets and PCs and other mobile devices. 
you know, that's the core skills that we actually need, just like we do in any other um, profession. So it's just an ongoing um, realisation, I think, of the value of your business as, as what it means to that community. Because we are, we're, libraries are big business. Mary, and I'm just wondering whether you have some sort of checklist or something like that when it comes to evaluating a new partnership. Yes. Um, our brand is very... Um, we are very protective of our brand and we just don't take the car yard down the road. Is that what you're probably alluding to? <laughs> or, commercial, or commercial arrangements. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, how do we evaluate them? We've got some of our program folk up the back here. Um, we have the pillars and we look for programs that actually either enhance our brand or, value, or deliver value to our customers. So, so there's two for a start. So there has to be a match and there has to be some outcome. And sometimes it's about joining up the dots to actually say, well, this is the outcome you want um, we can help you with that and we can deliver that for you. Um, we see gaps too in the market. Um, one of our staff, Anna here, we just, the adult literacy through TAFE closed down and there was nowhere on the, across the city to, um, for people to come and learn English. I know that sounds unusual and, and Anna's delivered a couple of programs, uh, conversation circles and the adult literacy training. So we're looking to the people who actually we partnered with at TAFE, we've taken them in a, in a private capacity and we can work with those to deliver similar programs. In the digital literacy space, we've got a couple of, um, they're bigger than startups, Silicon City and another one down at um, Rabina who, um, Serendipitously, we probably come across, but it's a bit of searching, joining those dots and, and presenting something that the other partner wants. Does that answer it enough? Or I could that, that's pick a good on question. Anna. So State Libraries just recently developed one for sponsorship arrangements for us because we, we face the same challenge about who will as we get approached by sponsors, who do we agree to take and, or who, who do we agree to partner with and who don't we? So it, it was a step through approach about evaluating what's in it for State Library, what's in it for the other partner, does it protect or enhance our brand, is it in line with... So we've got a bit of a checklist. It might be way higher level than what you're looking for and not applicable, but happy to share that with you. But it, a very good question because we keep pushing encouraging partnerships and partnerships and partnerships. And it's no good just forming a partnership so you can name them on your next grant application. Oh, we're partnering with Rotary down there. It's no use, from, from my experience in local government, it was no use just having a partnership that we could list. It was about developing an approach that made it mutually beneficial um, and having really fully engaged, powerful partners rather than just more partners. So I'm not, I'm not sure of anyone around the network that's got a partnership application form, but we can um, we try and find out for you. Uh, there was one, what, what you know, always puts me uh, nervous. There was one um, library in southwest England who partnered with one of the big banks over there, and they promoted them widely. You know, it was on all their documentation, and the bank something happened in that community where the bank actually foreclosed on a lot of their. Um, <laughs> Uh, residents and it created a really bad problem for the library because they'd been associated with the big bad bank. So um, I know we're not in that league, but it, it's just, Wait. it's always, you know, that happened about 10 years ago and it's been, in, whenever someone speaks partnership, it's um, quite curious. But it, we, we get a lot of support from community groups and businesses as well and so far, yeah, what's in it for us? is paramount, but we actually sell it is how do we work together? Uh, I think something you mentioned before about, uh, well, Ross, com commercial, the commercial relationships. I mean, these are partnerships that you're building, but with commercial entities. So understanding what their expectations are to, mm -hmm. to get out of that partnership as, as well as yours. And uh, perhaps 
casting a bit of a um, an eye across the the potential from a, a commercial perspective, such as the example with the bank of uh, of areas where that partnership may not work in uh, in the best interests moving forward. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, yeah just following on from that, Marion, you mentioned I think uh, something like eleven hundred partners or something. <laughs> we delivered, um, and we're pro rata. We're, we're really starting on this. We delivered four thousand um, programs last financial year, and eleven hundred and fifty of those were delivered by community and business. Yeah. So, so one of the things we've we've partnered with um, some smaller organisations, sometimes an individual. Yeah. Um, because some of these technologies and ideas just aren't well supported. Like we've had universities come to us and say we want to do three D printing. But do we really want a university grade curriculum level bureaucracy? It, we're actually, we just want to do some workshops with some kids and we want that flexibility to be able to try different things and experiment. I'm just wondering if you've got any advice around managing. You've got a large number of partnerships, probably scaling from a larger corporate partnership down to a smaller community group. How you manage that breadth of partnership and, and what that means from your perspective? We started to go down the path that you first mentioned where there was very formal guidelines around um, the partnerships and what they would do for us and, and, and it was just quite cumbersome and I think Robin Archer who's one of our strategic advisors um, for the city said art is the, one of the best places to explore dangerous ideas and I've got that around a bit way but, but I don't think formality is the key I think it's that opportunity to have a go and just come in. You can come into our media lab. The, we, we charge the printer, it's $5 a cubic inch. We don't, and it's a, um, it's not just the little MakerBot one. It, it's, it's, a, it's one of the, similar to one that Griffith University has, the next model up. You know, encourage entrepreneurialism, encourage creativity and encourage adventure and opportunity. And I think we get much better outcomes from that than we would, um, then uh, we would have gone down had we gone down this other very rigorous path. Anything else? Any other comments uh, from you guys about this afternoon? We're interested in, has anybody been challenged to, to think a bit differently about what they're, what they're doing uh, in their own communities when it comes to, to digital literacy from any of the ideas that you've heard? in any of the workshops today or from any of the speakers? No. I think that's a good sign that we're uh, ready for a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Well, listen, I'm uh, just wrapping up with some key concepts that we've covered off from today. But before I do that, can we just thank our panel of speakers this afternoon, Marion, John and Ross. Thank you, guys. You guys can you guys can sit here and keep me company while I wrap up. <laughs> I feel like in conversation. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a good lounge kind of approach. We need the lamp. Um, yeah, so thank you again for everyone. I, I really hope that today's been um, educational, enlightening, and inspiring for you all. There's been some really critical concepts that I think have come through uh, a lot of the speakers and a lot of the sessions today. And uh, for me, uh, there's a lot that came around. You know, this idea of, of literacy as a, as a skill uh, for participants in a, in a modern society that, that we now uh, see emerging. Uh, and also the, 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 kind of the collaborative, the, the parallel idea of that being uh, about digital citizenship as well. So our liter you know, the literacy skills that we learn as a way to, to function, but there being, you know, an overlay of what it means to be a good digital citizen and that being a, a something that within a community-based environment, such as what a library can deliver, uh, being another area of contribution that, uh, that we can all make. And understanding what the role of the library is in connecting our, the communities around uh, those facilities uh, with not just the, the knowledge that's now being delivered through different types of medium, uh, but also the skills for all of our um, community mem members to be able to participate in that digital uh, society. There are some commercial realities around digital literacy. There's no getting around it. Uh, as great as any of our programs may be, sometimes delivering these, uh, these services and programs for digital literacy are, are very much reliant on infrastructure, on equipment, on connectivity. Uh, so there's, there are some definitely commercial realities that influence uh, 
uh, our community's access to some of the higher levels uh, of this connectivity. But I think it's really important, and it has been said a number of times, you know, understanding whether it be from you know, very analytical or data-driven evidence of what the community needs are, or just purely from uh, your roles in participating in your local community, understanding what the basic services and opportunities are for uh, your community members to be able to interact with different levels uh, of that digital society. Um, we've been talking at length this afternoon around partnerships and around uh, how critical they are to delivering some of these services that are uh, becoming more and more expected but uh, on, uh, on continuing to be uh, either dim diminishing or static uh, budgets and that's been something that I know everyone is, uh, is quite eager to find some, some resolution to or some pathways forward around. The idea of um, information within our libraries being a lot more fluid than they used to be uh, is important as well from that idea of partnerships and not operating in isolation, but understanding that there's much more of a, a fluid nature to the information that passes through in the digital economy and being able to work with those uh, so that we're able to be uh, active participants in that. There's a lot of resources uh, available uh, from that statistics and, and evidence-based understanding of, of what our uh, community looks like and how that shapes up and we saw that from Jenny's presentation with, uh, with those community profiles being something uh, as a tool to be able to, to power those decisions uh, around what, uh, what evidence is required to deliver those, uh, those programs. And really understanding that uh, you know, the success of those is tied to the, the goals and desires and the aspirations of those people within our local communities. So those are just some of the key concepts I think um, you know, that really stood out to me. I'm sure through the course of the day there's been others that, that have been touched on that you've uh, resonated with um, specifically, with, with, um, uh, particularly with regards to where you guys are all at in your own communities. Um, the content from today's session, as we've said before, is being recorded. The aim is for that information to be available to you online by the end of the month. And you'll be receiving uh, email notification from State Library about when that information is available and how you can access it. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank the State Library of Queensland, to Jeanette, uh, Colin, uh, Crosby, uh, and to all of the staff, to Ross and all the staff that have been in, uh, involved in putting on today's uh, forum, I'd just like to um, show our appreciation to those guys for their assistance in doing that. And just a final thank you to all of our speakers and workshop leaders today for the content and for the uh, expertise and insights that they've been able to provide to us. Uh, thank you very much everybody for that as well. Uh, it's been my pleasure to be uh, part of today's proceedings and I really hope that, uh, that you leave today yeah, inspired and encouraged uh, and motivated to really uh, get involved in the, di uh, the digital uh, revolution and evolution that's happening around us and I'm sure that uh, with the information you're armed with today there'll be a great combined success with you all in your particular communities and programs. So thank you very much and have a safe travel home. Cheers.